to Bert and Martha Loby. Born in Alberta, but raised in Saskatchewan, Bert Loby spent half of his professional life working with Mennonite Church and related agencies, Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonite World Conference, Habitat for Humanity, and Mennonite Coalition for Refugee Support. The other half of his professional life, he served as a principal in public, church, and international schools. Together with his wife, Martha, Bert's service with MCC included stints in India, where Martha worked as a surgical nurse, and in community health, and Bert was the director of the Mennonite Relief Committee. They've done a lot of work um, in India, Nepal. Uh, Bert served as the MCC country representative, and they returned to the region in 2005 when Bert became interim country representative in for MCC in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Between overseas assignments, the Lobies lived in North America where Bert served as the MCC Asia Director out of Akron, Pennsylvania, and then the Overseas Director of MCC Canada in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Bert has arts and education degrees from the University of Saskatchewan and an MA from the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Using her training as a registered nurse, Martha served for three years in community health in India and for nine years in a variety of community hospitals in Canada. While in Hong Kong for seven years, she worked in a classroom setting with preschool children. More recently, she volunteered with her local hospice organization relating to elderly and terminally ill persons. Martha enjoys hosting friends and family, local and international, in their home and is grateful for many relationships locally and cross-culturally. Please welcome Bert and Martha Loby to talk about mountains and monasteries. Hi, welcome and good to see you. And if I were being proper, this would be around your neck, which will happen when you enter into Lhasa, Tibet. It is called a taka, symbol of welcome and good faith in enjoying your time together. So the taka can come mostly in white, though in Nepal, they sometimes are golden. Um, I'm gonna just briefly introduce myself a little bit, even after what Sarah mentioned. Uh, we've lived in Asia for some 20 years with MCC and in the field of education. And during that time, we enjoyed learning about people their culture, their history, and studying language together with them. We enjoyed um, learning to know uh, different foods and uh, moved back to St. Jacob's from Hong Kong in 2003. And after having been there for probably about two months, I realized I had not ridden an elevator for quite some time. <laughs> um, Bert and I just returned Tuesday night from this amazing trip through Hong Kong, Chengdu, China, Lhasa, and a journey by road to Everest Base Camp, and then on to Kathmandu. It took us from 5,050 meters at the camp down to Kathmandu to 1,400 meters, so going up and down a fair bit. We're not experts, but we love to learn and experience people and cultures in different places. Our goal tonight is to uh, share a little bit of the people we met and the beauty that uh, is uh, part of the uh, uh, area of Tibet. Tibet has changed more in the last 19 years than it has in the previous 1,000 years. When we went to Tibet in 1999, there were 30,000 people in Lhasa. Today, there are half a million. What we want to do tonight is four simple things. I'm going to show you a little bit of our sojourn in Hong Kong, then in Chengdu, then in Tibet and Nepal. We'll follow that outline with some maps. And if you have questions during the webinar, please raise your hand, stop us. We'll pick up the questions as we go. And uh, we hope to take not more than 15 or 20 minutes and then lots of time for conversation with you. Um, Right here. In the region, Lhasa, Tibet, and in Tibet, it's about six million people. Um, uh, of the six million, there's uh, about a half a million in uh, two hundred thousand in India, 
two, 2 million outside of Tibet. Notice that all the rivers, the big rivers of Asia, emanate from or flow from the Tibetan plateau. Uh, that's the Mekong, the Indus in Pakistan, the Ganges in the Gangetic Plain below Nepal coming into the Gangetic Delta in what is now Bangladesh. And then, of course, the Brahmaputra, Brahmaputra, son of Brahma, coming into the Delta as well. So the mountains and the Irrawaddy in, in what is now Myanmar and the Mekong, these mountains essentially water this part of Asia. Hong Kong is made up of about 8 million people, 30 islands. It's, it's, it's a marvelous uh, place to live. We were there seven years, enjoyed it immensely. Most people think of Hong Kong as only concrete and high rises. There's terrific trails on the islands uh, and uh, it, it's, it's just a great place to be. We were there um, during the big typhoon, the number 10, the most severe typhoon in the last 25 years, they said. And actually it's amazing that during that day, we were up on the 30th floor of our hotel in Aberdeen, close to the water, you could see the toilet, the water swishing in the toilet and the curtains moving at 30, 30 stories up. And the next day by noon, the city was mobile. Nobody was injured or hurt. So this place has its hillsides concreted and this place knows how to deal with typhoons. They come and they go. The thing about Hong Kong though, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. It's a gorgeous city at night. We'll go up to Victoria Peak and get a view of the city at, at night. Uh, the, this, the thing about this city, though, is that um, it, uh, it, it, democracy is under threat. The Chinese look at history not in 10 years, but in 50 or 100 year sweeps. So the, the democracy movement in Hong Kong is, is uh, uh, it's under a lot of pressure. China has a new strongman, Xi Jinping, who is more powerful than Mao even. He's there for life. He's a no-nonsense guy, gets stuff done, but he's actually very authoritarian. And the democracy movement in Hong Kong is very, very worried. They just refused the visa to, for Victor Mullet, a uh, British uh, citizen who was head of the uh, National For Correspondence Club. You can tell the people in Hong Kong post-97, when the turnover happened, are worried. They're worried. And again, Hong Kong was turned over to the British in 1842 after the first opium war. What is it that make Hong, makes Hong Kong go? There's three things. It's money, and it's money, and it's money. That's what makes the place go. And there's good people there. To trails, Martha, say a little bit about the trails. Um, we had arrived on a Saturday morning and had decided we were going to go hiking, which we did. And the trail we chose was Dragon's Back, uh, a wonderful hiking trail. We must have hiked for about five hours, 37 degree heat, humidity of probably at least 100, <laughs> but uh, a great, great hike with a wonderful view of the ocean and islands beyond. Uh, that's something we hope to do. Um, it's quite doable, just bring lots of water. We also visited uh, the flower market on the Kowloon side. We stayed on Hong Kong Island at that time and um, uh, took the Star Ferry and the MTR across to the flower market. Anything else in Hong Kong? Um, I think one of the things that, because of the typhoon, our days there kind of got shifted. We had stayed in the hotel and played Scrabble and had great food, but we'd like to do um, a junk ride out to Lama Island and also visit the big Buddha on Lantau Island, Lantau Island, which is where the uh, uh, new airport is. So those are some things that kind of got shifted because of the typhoon. So those are plans for us for Hong Kong. If, if you, um, Jim was talking about density. Uh, if you think of density in terms of Bangladesh, where you have in the size of Wisconsin, 150 million people, you think of Hong Kong, it's the densest place population wise is in Hong Kong. It's on the Kowloon side. I think it's about 800 people per square, uh, per square color. In, in the market, you can hardly get around without moving like this. Are we okay? Okay, good. We're going to move on to the second place, Sichuan province. Sichuan province, one of China's most populous province, would be the eighth largest country in the world if it were an independent country. 
it has about 350, 400 million people. It's the breadbasket of China, and it's um, uh, we, we spent a full two days there. China has uh, 29 provinces, and again, the Yangtze River is a major part of this this area of China. One of the neat things about China is uh, the 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 Tang Dynasty. The in Chengdu, there's uh, the peace poet from the Tang Dynasty, Tu Fu. Uh, there's a, a a garden. It's a marvelous garden. He lived during chaotic times. The emperor was a, 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 a bit of a playboy, lots of internal wars. He was a poor traveling uh, poet. His father was a poet, a marvelous peace poet. Uh, I have some poetry along. Uh, I, I won't read it now. I thought I might, but we, we'll visit this park, walk through it, and read some of his poetry together. Uh, another place that is absolutely fascinating in the area is the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the, in the city of Dijian. The um, May River has been dammed 2,200 years ago, and that irrigation system still flows through, uh, providing uh, water and to the agricultural area. And uh, the bridges that are across come are, go back to many, many years. Um, the Chengdu Plain has been free of flooding since this was built 2,200 years ago. And um, that is just the science and the way it was built 2,200 years ago is really quite something. The other thing that's really fascinating about um, Dujian is the old city and the walk through the old city of, um, of Dujian. One of the bridges um, that goes across from the thing. Of course, this is a highlight of Chengdu. <laughs> uh, but before we do that, let me just read um, uh, one short uh, poem from, uh, from Du Fu, the peace poet. Full of bitterness, taken from our homes to be sent past far western frontiers, knowing well that with time limits set, all infringements will be punished. Wondering why the emperor, who controls so vast a territory, should want to extend it, cut off from the love of home folk, we hold back tears and shouldering spears are forced to march away. This is the best peace poet in the different dynasties in India. We'll go through the, co the cottage, the park, and then we'll read some of his poetry outside together as a group. Um, we should say a little, uh, anything else about the Dujiang Martha? Um, I, think, I think just the walking, uh, we spent a good five hours probably walking through the irrigation project and the temples that are set up along there, the bridges and just the old roads that are part of it. Uh, the other, um, yeah, no, go ahead. The Panda Reserve, the, uh, the marvelous uh, kind of reserve and the breeding center. It's 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 very neat. It's it's uh, beautiful gardens. It uh, they really set it up well. Uh, you get close up views as a panda without um, messing around, uh, interfering with them. Lots of young babies. The thinker. And then we move to, to, to bed. Anything else? Oh, on yeah, just one other thing I wanted to mention about Ch Chengdu. If you do any research on Chengdu, there's an old street and market area era, area from, um, oh, the, the Qing Dynasty, I believe it is Qing, if I'm pronouncing that, Q-I-N-E. Yeah. And um, it's a marketplace which has a wonderful uh, food stall area of Sichuanese food. And um, the, the uh, temple of the Marquis is also there, which is another uh, lovely area. So that's one other visit, just a stroll through the old streets of Chengdu. Yes. And then we'll move to the third part to Tibet. Um, again, um, three different people uh, in, in Tibet itself, Tibetans, uh, 200,000 in India, mostly in Dharamshala in the north, where the Dalai Lama fled from. Uh, Lhasa, the summer palace, not Blinka, next to the Putala. He fled in 59, uh, disguised as a, as a warrior, and uh, went to Dharamshala, where India gave him uh, refuge. 
The important thing to know about Tibet is it's sandwiched between India in the south and uh, China in the, in the north. And it suffers from that immensely in terms of which way does it go. And those superpowers really play with it a lot. You can see the yellow boxes. Uh, Chengdu is the, the, the far, far west, uh, far east. It's a two-hour plane ride from Chengdu into Lhasa, Tibet. It's at about 13,000 feet. Uh, Martha, say a little bit about uh, uh, the altitude and dynamox and breathing yeah. and stuff. The flight from uh, Chengdu to Lhasa takes you to an elevation of 3,650 some meters. So that's an immediate. And you'll notice it when you get off the plane. Um, this is where we were greeted with the katas, a symbol of welcome. And we were told, as we met our guide there, I think we got there around noon or one o'clock. He said, there is nothing for you to do today. Walk slowly and don't take a shower, but drink lots of water. <laughs> so uh, the slow, slow pit place is really, really important. Um, Diamox is something we uh, took, uh, which is a diuretic, which helps with cerebral edema, swelling of the brain when you get to that high altitude. Um, I think we've taken it most times. I didn't take it when we went to um, Cusco, and I did need to use some oxygen at that point, but oxygen is always available. So that was an option, and we decided to do that, as did the rest of our group. We always had oxygen along with us in the, in the van for the six, seven days we were in Tibet. It was with us all the time. We didn't, essentially didn't use it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing, again, Tibet, six million people, three million in Tibet, and then different numbers in Nepal, about 16,000, Bhutan, about 5,000, the neighboring countries. And then uh, uh, in China, different places, about 2 million. Um, the, um, um, the, the, the thing to understand about Tibet, we were there in uh, 99 and now, it has changed so dramatically. It's unbelievable the changes and the pace of changes. And one has to understand that it is an occupied territory. So you don't talk about the Dalai Lama and you don't ask political questions because you don't know that the guide is out, will be Tibetan, he was Tibetan, and the driver is Han Chinese. You know, in, in Lhasa, where you have a half a million people and the government offices are there, you actually have about 50% of the people working in the government offices at the state level, Han Chinese. There is a serious dislike uh, uh, of the Han Chinese on behalf of the Tibetans. I could tell you some stories. It's very, very clear. And, and so one wants to be uh, very cognizant of, of that. Um, um, let's keep going here. There's the road we'll take. We start in Lhasa. Most of our days, we go to Shigatse. There's a big temple. Let's say through here, Tingri, we come all the way down to Mount Everest base camp. We'll talk about that and show you there. Then we come back up and here and we took to the uh, travel to the border of uh, between um, uh, Tibet and Kathmandu. That's the story we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about later that journey. It was just incredible. Before we go to the, oh, there you go. Yeah. I want to talk about the Kapala. We arrived anyway. We took on that afternoon off, and then the next morning he suggested we do the Potala, which was pretty quick considering we had just arrived at the altitude. But mid 70s, that we all were, we did just fine. <laughs> so, a little bit about our group. Um, yeah, we're friends, Conrad and Chris Brunk, who Conrad used to teach here at Grable, and uh, Lorna Sawatsky, whose husband was president at Grable here before. We've traveled together and we're from 74 to 76, so. And her knees and hips. And, and Chris had just had, Chris had both knees and both hips done and had her last hip done just five months ago. So um, it's quite doable, but it is strenuous. The walk up the patella was something like, I think they say 432 steps. I didn't count it. I was too busy watching where I was walking. The steps are narrow and deep, and it takes a ton of energy to get to, uh, there's 2,000 rooms in this place. It was built in the 7th century AD. It is simply stunning with big rooms for the monks. Used to hold thousands of monks, very few left anymore. 
There's lots of area. There's a place where they where the Dalai Lama lived uh, when he was there. Most of these monasteries have both residences and and areas for the monks to gather. And and uh, the, the word for community in, in Buddhism is sangha, the sangha, the community of monks. And it is nothing short of stunning. When you stand there and look at it like this, it is absolutely unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. And we were fortunate; we had lovely blue skies, which made it really nice. But uh, the walk up is great. We uh, we have some pictures in the back about our 1999 visit to Tibet, and you can you get a bit of a sense of the difference. The the mountains are really, really, really stunning. And you drive along them for so long. Often we did about 200 kilometers a day, good van, good driver, very safe. But the elevations in the passes and the switchbacks, very, very steep up and down. Go ahead. Oh, the other thing that I might want to mention is that Everest was referred to as Umalanga, which is the Tibetan word for Everest. And that's how the Tibetan guide talked about Everest. Um, I, I think um, we're, we're going back to the Jokhan. Yes. Okay, in the Bhutala, and then there's also the Jokhan Temple, which is one of the oldest and most sacred temples for the Buddhist people. Um, Bert was talking a little bit about the difference between the Han and the Tibetan people. It is incredibly important and sacred that when you walk that what's called a kora is you do your pilgrim walk around different places that you go clockwise and it is obvious at times that you will see the security people purposely walking the other direction it is considered sacrilegious to do it that way but that's great there's also you will also see a number of pilgrims prostrating themselves all the way around the kora uh, just There's three or four quarters of circular areas, one around the Potala, around the Jokan Temple, one inside, and then one that goes around the Potala. So there's three or yeah. four of those quarters, and people walk around them, and they come as pilgrims, and they prostrate themselves, and they're praying, and they go for hundreds of meters that way. And they're also in their prayer wheel. Uh, they're usually spinning their prayer wheel them as they walk. As we uh, walk through the Jokan, in La the center of Lhasa, in the center of Bukhara Square, the center of the old city, there was this monk sitting. And, and I, I, we have learned we don't take pictures of others without permission. So you have a camera, and it, it's always uh, trying to look at the eyes and see if there's a, a point at the camera, and if there's a yes with the eyes or no, trying to be sensitive. This gentleman is living in London. He's from the Gangetic Plain in India. He's fluent in English, and he was in the Jokan making his... Uh, pilgrimage and he he indicated I could take a picture and we had a long conversation uh, offered his email address I didn't ask by the way if you look at the back there there's a couple books you should look at if you're going to do this trip with us one is Jonathan Spence to change China 300 years from the 1600s to 1960 why was it that the the western influence in China including the missionary movement was such a failure Jonathan Spence answers that superbly in his book He's out of Yale. It's an old book, but it's a good book. Read the last chapter uh, if, if you just want to get a summary of it. But this this gentleman uh, uh, embodied the best of, of, of uh, monasticism. Say a little bit about monks. I, th I think the, uh, we often think that monks are only, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just, that they're celibate. This is not the case, though um, they you will often see them debating in the monasteries. Um, yeah. and actually, when the monks, uh, whether it's Sri Lanka or southern uh, India, when you, when you see Buddhism in the Darjeeling area and other areas, you'll see them with a bowl going around in the morning or Myanmar. That the whole notion of giving in Tibetan Buddhism is that, and, and all of Buddhism, both schools, is that. What I'm doing when I come with my with my bowl is giving you an opportunity to support to, to give to me. It's not it's 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 not what you're doing for me. It's what I'm offering you an opportunity to be part of. It's a whole different understanding of giving of alms. These kinds of views, uh, as we drove, just stunning with prayer flags, stunning views of the mountain. This is Everest, North Face. Uh, you need about 45 days to, to climb it. You do it in either June or September. And we were 
Well, we were at base camp at about 17,500 feet. We'll show you some pictures of that. Stunning views of, uh, of Everest. The skies were blue, just gorgeous views. Uh, the prayer wheels. Now, Martha, you've got to tell this story. This was in one of the monasteries called the Sarah Monastery. Um, we did go to quite a few, actually, but it was really, this was one of my favorites. It's these young, most of them were young monks, but they were out in the courtyard and um, they do this a couple of times a week where they go and debate. And what was so fascinating is one guy was, the, you see the man standing. And he's the student, the, the one sitting is the teacher. And so the student was trying to make his argument. And so what they would do is they would simply stand there. And when he made a point, he'd go like this. Yeah. I got you. So he made his <laughs> so point. It was stunning. Yeah. And they, they, they opened the, uh, the temple to tourists, but you, you cannot use a big camera. You can use your cell phone. I don't know why the distinction. Or your, your little playbook, but you can't use a big camera to hit, get photos. Marvelous views. We're not only showing you views of the places and the beauty, but of some people and faces. Martha always reminds me that when I do my photography, I tend to do faces, uh, people, uh, when there's permission. Honored and Chris. You know, when you travel together, Jim was talking. It, it, one of the things about traveling in groups that we've learned is you, you better like each other. And you, you better be patient with each other because we were together for f almost four weeks with Conrad and Chris and Lorna in a lot of places and we had a really good time together. And it means you give up a little of yourself and your own way of doing things. That's just the way it is and it's great. And some of our conversations, I mean, you have time to be in conversation like you just don't have at home. Lorna? The wishes that the women are doing that. I mean, the pilgrims are doing the chora, walking around in a certain direction. Yeah, this is in the in the main old market area. Lots of shops. I got a really good hat here, and I lost it. I forgot it. So it was a good felt hat. There's a picture of it coming. Marvelous pictures around the the Jokan. And it's always important to get the eye of someone in that group so that they don't think your camera is, you're not infringing. Uh, actually, actually, yes, this is the one right here. This, uh, the, but, but you didn't lose it there. No, I left it in a restaurant. <laughs> but it was, it was one of the typical hats that men are wearing. And you notice they all have prayer beads and they're as they're doing their walking, it's the prayer wheel or the prayer beads that they're focusing on. <clears throat> no. no. That's a really good question. The, uh, the, we've said to, to Imagination that we'd rather not have more than 12 people in this group. We've said, secondly, that you have to be able to walk at least 10 kilometers a day, that capacity. And we've said that uh, uh, um, people should be healthy. Like you, if you're over 70, you should talk to your doctor to make sure that you're, you, you can withstand it. And by the way, uh, we manage fine, all of us. All of us manage fine. Were we weak uh, from the elevation and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the thin air? Yeah, there were times when we didn't have much energy. It's just the way it is. You got to move slowly. How many of you have traveled at elevation? Anybody? You guys have. What did you notice? It, 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 it. Yep. Yep. Yes. Good point, Lynn Jewett is making, you know, conscious of your diet, conscious of lots of water intake, conscious of what your body is doing, how it's how you're feeling, very, very important. This is one of the big glaciers. It's receded about 400 meters in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, um, 
when you drink lots of water going back, you know what your body does. You, you... This is my story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a new term on this trip. I don't know if you guys know what freelancing is. Well, anyway, not all the toilets are great, you know, and we kind of figured out that maybe sometimes that wasn't exactly where we wanted to go. So our tour guide said, well, you can either use the toilet that's provided or you can freelance. <laughs> so there we were finding our own spot to freelance. And when we were ever space camp, it was minus 13 at night when we were outside. However, the moon was bright. It was mm -hmm. full moon on Everest. Not so bad freelancing at that. It was actually, I, I was out at two in the morning and I needed to go a little longer. And it was actually a very, very fine experience. And I was not cold. The toilets are a concern, right? They are. They're not great. Uh, they're... I mean, they're all squatty potties, as you all know. However, they're not cleaned very often no. when you're out like this. So out in the field, is really quite wonderful. Solar energy? <laughs> Eating water? Everest back there? We just had marvelous views of the mountain ranges. Really stellar views. Yes, we will. We're going to tell you about the trip down from the roof of the world, 17,000 down to five, and it will not, we will not do it again with this group. It's just too, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable experience. There we are, three kilometers ahead, and you're on the snow trail up the face, north face of Everest. And, and we had pretty much all the clothes that we, we traveled with carry-on size suitcase. But you layer and you have good long johns and whatever you've got you wear so you sure do that, no. and and once you put it on getting to the base camp you didn't take it off until you left the next day somewhere where it was warmer <laughs> yeah this is the this is the base camp we slept in yak tent uh our group of five were sort of in one area and then there probably were about 10, 10 or 12 in the other area um so the beds were there. We had taken sleep sacks, um, but the other part of the quilts and pillows and stuff was all there. We lined up one, two, three, four, five, crawling over each other at night when we needed to go and enjoy the, the moonlight. <laughs> but it was, it was fun. Hot soup. They provided hot soup the evening we got there because it's really cold. There's the inside of the tent. The bedding was clean. Yeah. We didn't come up with anything. Just stunning. The stupas, you know, are just, uh, it, it just doesn't get much better than this. The gateway to the park, the Everest Base Camp is considered a, a national heritage, park, site. heritage treasure. And the prayer flag. Everywhere, um, everywhere. The expedition was to go Everest. Brenda's question is. How many, uh, um, relatively speaking, how many of those that attempt to summit Everest uh, go from the north side of Tibet versus the Nepal side? Well, can I respond? Please. The, the cost to summit from the south face in Nepal is about 50,000 US dollars per person. It generally can take about 45 days, depending on the group. And the north face doesn't get nearly as many people Although at base camp, they told us there were over a thousand people there. So there was lots of cars and people at base camp on the Tibet side. It's, it's awful hard, relatively speaking, to, uh, to get into uh, to Tibet versus getting into Nepal, it's difficult. There's permits, there's all kinds of hoops to go through. Uh, so it's, it's, it's much more difficult and it's more expensive actually. And we didn't, because this wasn't the, we were late for the summiting season because we were there in October. And that is too late to try to come up. So we didn't see any of those um, people there. Uh, I had a couple of movies in, but we needed to take them out. So I want to show you the agriculture. Oh my! This you, everybody thinks it's just ice and snow. It's a it, it's a, it's a plateau, but they grow immense amounts of barley 
And barley is the staple, much like wheat is for us, in, especially in Western Canada. And so lots of pictures of people in the fields. We stopped and got some great photos. Again, they use a weed whacker with a solid uh, little disc on the end that cuts very fast. And they cut that way. And then the, the women generally do the gathering. Get a picture here? Yeah. The women do the gathering and put them in stoops. And we never did discover where they do the thrashing. Because there's so much barley grown. The other things that are grown are tubers, potatoes, yeah, vegetables, yeah, vegetables carrots, and, those kind of things. and lots of plastic uh, to maximize the sun uh, greenhousing. Uh, greenhousing. One thing that we did, uh, sort of the Tibetan guide was uh, saying, is that they have central threshing areas, kind of yeah. like we used to do in the old. So there would be big trucks that would come and gather that up just to do it. We stopped and we're in the field getting some pictures. And I asked the gentleman, if I could take a picture, and then I offered him some money, and he said no. He said didn't need any money. I wanted to honor their uh, willingness to have us there. And then the lady came, and she was ready to receive it. So I, this is the lady. She was marvelous. This is the gentleman. Very warm. The agriculture just fascinating. Along the rivers, there's so much fall colors. They're very much like Ontario fall colors along the river. Tibetan flags. Flag. There's the hat. That's a great hat, and I'm so sorry I forgot it. Taking too long, sorry. Yeah. On the yaks. And... Um, Mastiff. Mastiff dog um, were used earlier on for herding, but now are kind of there for tourists to look at and are kind of dressed up and it's kind of sad to see. You don't, you, here there's lots of little trinkets for sale and our guide was clear, you, you don't touch anything, you touch it, you've bought it. And if you've bought it, you, you, you better not have touched it before you start the bargaining process because you're a tourist, and so it's just like in Calcutta, India. If you don't know the price of the rickshaw, that's not the rickshaw driver's problem. That's your problem. So you pay what what you're worth. If you don't know that, then you pay. So then we went down to Nepal, and again, Martha and I have traveled in Sikkim, which is here three times, up to twelve thousand, with school groups from Hong Kong, and to Bhutan. Um, Bhutan is is amazing. Just gone through an election. So we came all the way from Lhasa here, all the way to Kathmandu here. Now, when we got to the border, in uh, let's talk, let's tell some stories about the trip down. Um, we didn't take any pictures. We were so busy holding on. <laughs> Eight hours in the jeep. Two hundred kilometers, six hundred hours, and um, there's lots of lorries on the road, big trucks because it's a moving area of transferring trade back and forth from Tibet. Lots of lorries and stuff from China. 50 or 60 lorries from China come in. They're lined up one lane traffic, one lane, and they're transshipping into lorries from Nepal, and the ruts are this deep. And tell them about the policemen. Oh, we, got, uh, we got through the border in Tibet, okay. Walked across walked the across, bridge. Across, carried our suitcases. Then we got through into the Nepali side and had an amazing Nepali guide. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful individual. Yeah. And so we get to another police check. I mean, there's a number of police checks along the way. But we get to this particular one and we're told that we cannot continue on with our Jeep because we have the wrong color license plate. <laughs> Mind you, they said, but here's some right here that have the right color license plate that <laughs> we will have you take. If you pay again, of course, and it seemed like that was theirs and there seemed to be. So we were probably there about an hour at the border trying to negotiate our driver, trying to negotiate what was happening. And finally, I decided to see what I could do with one of the young security men. And my you Hindi, want some magic with him. My Hindi is similar enough to Nepali that we could convert have some conversation back and forth. So I asked him about his family, asked him if he liked his work. And then I told him, you know, that we were their guests and surely 
we should be able to let them go. And this went on and on. And he came back and chatted and we went back. Four and, and a half later. And finally he said, I said, you know, we were really getting worried about this. And finally he just came up to me. He said, do minute, Arab. Do minute, Arab. Two minutes and there will be peace. <laughs> it worked. Uh, he did something. You used your female skills with him really well. I thought you you enamored him. That was good. But we had a guide, Kana, uh, uh, who had been in Boston for five years from Nepal. So we had paid and we had a, it all arranged, and we, we could have done it on our own with our Hindi. Negotiated a a, a a car to go down from the Nepal side after we walked across the border to go down. Well, we decided to have the, the tour agency get the, the car and the guide for us. The guide was marvelous. We have his address. We'll get him again. But, uh, but definitely uh, this road trip will not oh, be a no, part no, of it. We can't do it. Um, I don't ever want to do it. It was again. too much. And the side of the edge was. Uh, we were and and passing people. We were often, the driver, the driver, a young guy, I'm sure he's no more than 25. His hands and his feet were part of the car. That guy knew how to drive, and he was cautious but bold. And he he went not too close to the edge, but my goodness, he sure went close. <laughs> close, but not over. I think what we're suggesting is that um, that we go back. There's another road that can go back to Lhasa, and then fly from Lhasa to Kathmandu. Yeah. Because that's is. the only way. It's the road or that. <laughs> uh, really seriously, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be wise to take the risk uh, and to, of that road. Depending on the number of people, you'd have to be in a bigger vehicle. Exactly. I'd sure hate to sit on the edge of that and watch no. that. And the lorries are coming and going, and oh, yeah, the ruts are deep. It was too much. Okay. Some more faces here. This is in Kathmandu, and say a little bit about Swayambhanath. Oh, we had an absolutely amazing bed breakfast with the view of Swayambhanath is one of the old, and it's also referred to as the monkey temple. And indeed, there were a lot of monkeys on the way up. One of the, how many steps did we say? 1,000. 1,000 steps to get to the top. It's not for the faint of heart, but it can be done. And it's wonderful to get to the top. The monkeys are very active and one gentleman had a bag that he was carrying some things and I, one of his drink bottles fell out. I, I think, yeah, Sprite. Well, before he could even reach down to pick it up, the monkey got it. <laughs> so he was sitting on one of the pillars trying to figure out how he was gonna get this <laughs> drink. And it was just quite fascinating watching him. He would bite the bottom and then it would run out and then he'd try to get it up and it couldn't work. So finally he'd put his hand underneath the bottom and just <laughs> scoop it up that way. So, yeah, great. Monkeys and markets. Lots of trinkets, lots of markets. Really quite neat markets for souvenirs. And again, the elderly gentleman walking in, uh, in Kathmandu. By the way, we should say a little bit about the earthquake in 2010. That's right. Uh, the, the old uh, Basantapur, the Darba Square, for those of you have been there before, um, the remnants of the earthquake were still very visible very in good. some of the cracks and in a lot of the supports that were holding up walls. Uh, they've tried to, I think, repair the most important aspects of that square, but it's still very visible, the earthquake. That was devastating to the country. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Nepal needs about half a million homes for folks that lost their homes in, in the earthquake. It's, it's a very poor country. We could talk about the politics in Nepal. It was a monarchy. It, it was the British, the British were in there since uh, the early 1900s. Uh, and then the, uh, the king was killed in, 2000 and, in 2001, I think, in a palace uh, uh, family debacle. And so the, king, the, the son killed the king and, and uh, others. And so the monarchy fell away. And in 2007, the strong Marxist uh, uh, revolutionary movement, peasants, Maoist party, they called them, Finally, in 2008, the country became a republic. It is moving now, but it's desperately poor, Nepal. Desperately poor. And and what is just a quick thing? Apparently, um, what India did, where they've always had good relationships with Nepal. Apparently, after the earthquake, India cut off the fuel uh, 
into the uh, country. And so there's mixed feelings. You know, I think yeah. Nepal would rather not become part of China, as Tibet has. But India doesn't seem to be quite ready yet to do what it's done for Bhutan or Sikkim. We should say, tell one story about the 1999 visit. We were in the old city, Bukhara, close to the Jokhan. It's the market. And in the market, there's lots of folks. There's some pictures back there of the 1999 visit. And the, we were we were bargaining for some Tibetan uh, yak bells for Christmas. We were going to put them up. And I, we had a nice conversation with the lady. Very, really fun. And we arrived at a price and bought one. And then she wanted to sell another two. And I kind of said, well, you know, we don't need them. They're quite heavy. And so I was trying to say no. And she persisted, persisted well. She was a good market. And the Han Chinese man from the Ministry of Education who was with us, we were hosted by the Ministry of Education in Beijing. They took us in because I had worked in China for 10 years negotiating agreements for the Mennonite colleges, MCC and the mission boards. And it was a quid pro quo program. Uh, we, we sent doctors, nurses, teachers, agriculturalists, and they sent scholars back to our universities in Canada and the U.S. And they'd always said to me, I was there March and uh, October of every year for 10 years. They said, we'll take you somewhere. I never had time. So when we were in Hong Kong, they said, well, can, we'll take you. And we said, they said, where? And we said, Tibet. So they took us, all expenses paid, 1999 to Tibet. And when we with the Ministry of Industry gentleman, he was a, a, a very powerful gentleman. And as the lady, she followed us back to the car and she wanted us to buy these two extra sets of bells. And I was saying, no, you know, in a, in a jocular way. And so we got to the car and I rolled up my window so that she, she wouldn't be able to persist so much. And uh, then she went around to the driver's side to the Ministry of Education person. And she persisted and they got into an argument and she actually spit in his face. And we, we, I was, I, we were terrified. We thought he would, he would have her life if he got a little and, and she left very quickly. She realized what she had done. The feelings between the Han Chinese, this is occupied territory. That's number one. The feelings towards the Han are very strong and very deep. But again, the Chinese view of history is long. They just, they, they, they just, uh, they just populate the city. Half a million people since 1999, and so they, whether it's Hong Kong or whether it's here, they will, they will persist. They take the long view. Fabulous monasteries, breathtaking roof of the world views of the world's highest mountains, and one of the most likable peoples in the human community. And it is occupied territory. We should allow for some questions. Do you want to say anything else? I'm good. Questions. I'll repeat the questions so folks can hear them. Yes. Nancy's question is why why our interest in Tibet? Uh, what what got us there? Do you want to say anything? No. I think I've never been. <laughs> you know, and it's uh, a beautiful area. You know, the Tibetan Buddhism has always fascinated me. And I've studied religions, as Jim has. And uh, one of the things about Buddhism that is so attractive is their, their whole view of things. Four simple points. Um, all of life is dukkha, suffering. Why is there suffering? Because there's desire. How do you deal with desire? The Eightfold Noble Path. Do things right. And when you do that, you will have happiness and peace. And there's the Four Noble Truths. So my point would be the Tibetan religious system. And by the way, religious systems are just that, systems. They're systems of thought and doctrines that are spun around systems and stories. And we have that in the Christian community as well. You know, the, the, the thing about Tibet that has always interested me was two things. Monasteries, Buddhism, and mountains. Very clear. We've been to, in uh, where we lived in the village in 66 to 69, we were 90 kilometers from uh, the, the from um, um, okay. Bodh where Buddha allegedly was enlightened. So we went there often. Lumpini in Nepal, where he was born, West Nepal. Uh, I still, and I've been to Dharamshala, where the, uh, where the Dalai Lama resides, uh, very close to having a meeting. He has audiences uh, when he's there pretty much couple times a week, and if you're lucky, you can be there, surrounded by the Tibetan Sanskrit texts. 
marvelous uh, a monastic community. So Buddhism has always fascinated me. That's, and, and so, and the mountains are just superb. And it's nice to get a bit of walking and hiking yes. while you're doing that. That yes. too is important. Other questions? No, we had this plan probably about a year with our friends. We were, oh. no, this, <laughs> they thought it might be a good idea to do. Um, Since we just came back, we kind of realized what would be some good things to do and what probably wouldn't work so well. Jim talked about travel. And you know, there's a difference between tourism and travel. Uh, uh, if you go with an inquiring spirit, if you go ready to be a guest and uh, put your judgments aside, put your mind in neutral on the things that are weird and strange and different and unclean or whatever, if you go ready to receive what is there and are a good guest, if you're ready to wander rather than settle, we've always been wandering people. That's been part of our problem uh, to settle in places. So wandering is, wandering is good, uh, it's fun. It, it's uh, there's so much to be experienced. It, it's kind of, I mean, to bet, I mean, there's a lot more tours now than there were 20 years ago, but it still is, is but has some intrigue. Say a little bit about um, medically, I think, to reinforce the, the fact that, that I just think it's important for people to be healthy people to be able to walk. Um, I mean, I'm not exactly a super, super fit person. We did fine. Um, I think it's important to check with your physician probably yeah. and find out. Uh, uh, we had also one of our persons had a atrial fibrillation issue and just in July and she was cleared by her physician that she was fine to go and had no issues with it. Uh, we all experienced, you know, a bit of headache, yeah. sluggishness. Uh, uh, the interesting thing was um, tingling sensation in our extremities which our guide said, well, that's pretty normal. The blood is headed to your major organs. It's not worried about your extremities, your fingertips or such. At one point, I had a nosebleed that yeah. sort of stuck with me for a couple of hours, but wasn't anything that wasn't that. So no, but it is important, to, as Len said, I think to be aware of what your body is saying and what yeah. your body is doing. What about space? What about, the question is, what about safety? Physical safety. You mean, um, oh. What yeah. about crime and, and uh, the context? Is it safe? I, I never felt unsafe. No, I, I didn't. Probably less so than some of the other larger tourist groups where you've got. Yeah. Uh, didn't feel unsafe in Hong Kong either. Feel very welcomed in Tibet. I mean, you 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 see the 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 the, the uh, hostility is too strong. You see the dislike that the Tibetans have for the Han Chinese. It's there, but it's not towards outsiders. And we should be clear that when they welcome folks that are visiting, they also understand that uh, we need to pay, and they're they're not apologetic about uh, offering us opportunity to 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 pay. And that's that's fair. It's not a criticism. It's just fair. But safety, um, we felt very safe. Uh, very safe. Non-issue. Issue food wasn't an issue for us. Although the hotel breakfasts weren't uh, exactly five star. No, but there's usually a boiled egg you can have. You know. Um, and porridge. What do they call it in, in Han Chinese? Kanji. Kanji. It's very good with raisins and walnuts. If you add enough to it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, food was never an issue for us at all. Other questions? Are we about done, uh, Sandra? Yeah. Any other questions? Well, we would be pleased to, to have a group of 10 or 12 uh, to join us in April. Uh, we would, I think, say clearly, uh, make sure you want to go. It's like in MCC when we do leadership orientations, when I've done them with them, I always say to people, to leaders that are going abroad, it's never too late to stay home. <laughs> if you're not ready in your spirit to go and to be curious and to uh, to enjoy some discomfort, then don't go. 
It's that simple. Please don't go. Because then we become a burden to others in the group and to the context. So you got to be ready to laugh at yourself. You got to be ready to be breathless and, and uh, just take in the beauty of the people and the models. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert and Martha and Jim, who's come back. Those were excellent presentations. You really opened up our minds and hearts, uh, showed us a sampling of what we might see on these tours. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Appreciate it. You may uh, enjoy yourself with some more snacks and tea. Uh, feel free to stay around and chat if you like.